You're listening to Conferences on Line Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is December 2nd, 2013, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, innate immunity. Our presenter is Dr. Christina Chacho. She's in the Division of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Okay, so today we're going to talk about t- Chapter 4, Innate Immunology, um, which has an overwhelming amount of information, but I'm going to try and highlight things, although, in all fairness, I may have time to work on this lecture, so I haven't seen it in a year either. So. <laughs> Uh, so the innate immune system is the first line of defense against infection. And everything in order to fight an infection is in place um, before an antigen is even encountered. So um, an antigen is not necessary for this arm of the immune system to be able to fight infection. Its job is to prevent, control, and eliminate infection. It recognizes products of, of damaged and dead host cells to eliminate the cells and then initiate tissue repair. And it is also vital uh, in stimulating the adaptive immune system uh, in, in telling the adaptive immune system how it should be uh, fighting against a particular infection as well. So uh, the lion's share of this chapter is actually about um, recognizing uh, microbial pathogens. And for the most part, the innate immune system does this through something called pattern recognition receptors. Um, so there are certain patterns that are unique to microbes. Um, we call them PAMPs, or pathogen-associated molecular patterns. There are um, patterns that tend not to be on mammals. Examples are double-stranded RNA, unmethylated CPG DNA, LPS. Um, but these patterns, in general, are things that are essential for um, survival of the microbe. And uh, as such, they haven't been able to evolve away from um, detection by the innate immune system. Uh, the innate immune system can actually also recognize host cells if they are damaged. And they do this by recognizing something called DAMP, or damage-associated molecular patterns. Um, but the concept is the same. So the pattern recognition receptors are encoded in germline DNA, uh, and they are ubiquitously expressed, and certainly in um, most cells associated with the innate immune system. So unfortunately, in this version of BOSS, it won't let me um, put tables onto um, on these presentations. Um, oh, however, table 4.3 on page 59, I think, um, is probably of everything to kind of um, put into your binder of things to know for the boards. This is, I think, probably the main table from this chapter. Um, it really kind of has the basics that we need to take away um, from the pattern recognition receptors. So one of the pattern rec- recognition receptors, uh, sorry, um, before we go there. So uh, pattern recognition receptors can be in several different locations. So they can be extracellular, um, they can be cytosolic, and they can be endosomal, depending on uh, what their role is in um, recognition of microbes. Okay, and then this is kind of the old table 4.3. The new one and the new abbas is much better, but again, I can't change it in the um, presentation, unfortunately. So one of the um, receptors that we know more about um, than some of the others is a class of receptors called toll-like receptors. Um, They are toll-like receptors because they all have this leucine-rich binding domain um, and then a ter-homology domain for signaling, or a toll-slash-IL-1 receptor homology domain for signaling. So it's just two parts that are um, very similar through all these different uh, toll-like receptors. so we're covering nine of them in here. I actually I kind of thought we know of more human PLRs than just nine, but I'm not sure about that. Um, so TLR1, 2, 4, 5, and 6 are all extracellular. 
and then PLR3789 are all intracellular. Um, you really do need to know what these bind to as well and where they're located. I would know a lot about TLR. These are, um, I think, great board questions. Um, but it helps to know where they are um, to know what they bind. So um, this next table, I think, um, Well, maybe this is from the old box. Well, this covers in depth what they um, bind to. So, three, seven, eight, nine. These are all endosomal TLRs, and that helps to know because they all bind DNA or RNA, and that kind of makes sense if you think about it. Because extracellularly, there's not going to be any DNA or RNA around to even be sensed. So the place where you're going to sense these things is in the endosome after something has been um, phagocytosed and partly broken down. That's when double-stranded DNA and single-stranded RNA are going to be um, exposed. So TLR3 um, binds to viral double-stranded RNA. TLR7 and 8 are single-stranded RNA. And then TLR9 is unmethylated CPG DNA. Um, classically, I think of TLR binding to LPS, TLR5, TLR4, LPS, TLR5, flagellin. Um, TLR2, peptidoglycan, but of course there's lots of things that they will bind to. And um, rest assured on the boards, I'm sure they won't ask you the one that it's easiest to remember, and we talked about the most, so probably be another one of these. Um, but I think this is all information that's very uh, important to know. So TLR signaling is also important um, to know. One, because uh, there are several diseases, a whole class of immune deficiencies that are associated with signaling defects in TLRs. Um, but for the most part, they signal very similarly with a couple of exceptions. And of course, the exceptions you do definitely need to know. So um, all of them signal through something called MyD88, except for TLR3. TLR3 signals independent of MyD88. It signals instead through something called TRIF. And then TLR4 has an option whether it wants to signal through MyD88 or TRIF. Um, so it can do either. CD3 is necessarily MyD88 independent. All the rest of TLR signal through this um, one protein called MyD88. So the whole point of signaling, of course, signaling from any receptor is to get a signal to the nucleus where something can happen. And of course, in this situation, TLRs typically will, um, will signal to the nucleus where um, new chemokines and cytokines can be produced that will control the immune system. So this is actually a little bit of a more in-depth picture that I included um, because it includes something called NEMO, um, which we know there's a NEMO deficiency. But again, uh, essentially the same TLR4 has an option of going through MIDI8 or MIDI8 independent pathway. TLR3 is necessarily uh, MIDI88 independent. And then everything else goes through MIDI88, IRAC4, um, down to the nucleus. Uh, Mighty 88, IRX4, NEMO, ICAPA B, and B. And Mighty 88 stands for Myeloid Differentiation Primary Response 88. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, and this I just actually pulled down to the internet for a more complete um, picture since this last one from Boss that I um, pulled out, left out Nemo. This you can actually pull down if you want to include it um, in your list of things to memorize um, from my presentation, which is on the server. Okay. Um, 
So what immune deficiencies are associated with TLR? Signine, of course, there is NEMO, um, which is ectodermal dysplasia with immune deficiency, where one is predisposed to pyogenic bacteria and mycobacterial infections, um, very similar to ICAP-B defect. If you are MIDE ADH, uh, if you have an abnormality in MIDE ADH, you're susceptible to pyogenic bacteria and mycobacterial infections uh, without the ectodermal dysplasia. HIRAC4, pyogenic bacteria, UNC93B or TLR3 to HSV encephalitis. And then TLR4 specific leads to nicerial meningitis. Okay. So as you can see, there's a lot of memorizing in this chapter, um, but I don't know if there's much explanation. I can give you only explanation. I really think that it's the bulk of what you need to know about toll-like receptors. They seem to come up. I mean, do they even come up in the fit bowl? Probably. There's lots of questions for the them. The bowl is just so random. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> okay. And NEMO stands for NF kappa B essential modulator. That is a, that I've heard come up before. That's a good, although that seems reminiscent of a simple question to me. Yeah, it's like anything is game. Right. <laughs> random. Yeah. Okay. So the next uh, pattern recognition receptors that are um, talked about in this chapter are NLRs or nod-like receptors, which also have a leucine-rich binding domain. Um, they have a signaling domain, but then they have this, um, I think it's NACT for binding to each other, N-A-C-H-T. And there are three subfamilies, CARD, PYRIN, and BUR. Um, this is actually from the New England Journal in 2009, um, an associated immune deficiency. Uh, homozygous CARD-9 mutation, a family with a susceptibility to fungal infections, so again, of this immune deficiency, it emphasizes the need to know what they do. Um, but again, it's just a pattern, pattern recognition receptor, nothing to get um, too upset about. It's for signaling. Um, OK. Uh, so it, then there is actually one called NOD2 um, that is associated with both Crohn's disease and Blau syndrome. Um, if there's an abnormality in it, um, this I would definitely know, I think, for both Crohn's and Blau syndrome. <clears throat> um, and then there's NLRP, which fl uh, forms inflammasomes and generates IL-1. And then there's one in particular called NLRP. Which is associated with hereditary fever syndromes that can be treated with IL-1 antagonism, um, and a kinra being the the IL-1 antagonist that we can use for kinra. Um, so this is actually Figure 4.4 on page 64 of the BAS um, chapter, and it actually just um, talks briefly about the NL, NLRP3 inflammasome. Um, so here you can see this leucine-rich um, binding region. And of course, you still have your signaling domain. But then you have this, this NASH region that will bind um, two together. Two pieces together in order <coughs> to, um, to effectively um, mediate the this, this signaling or this uh, inflammatory process. RLRs are rig-like receptors, cytosolic sensors of viral RNA. They produce type 1 interferons. Examples are rig 1 and MDA5. I'm not much sure there's much more to say about rig-like receptors. Carbohydrate receptors or lectins, we talk about these from time to time. For example, would be C-type lectins. Um, lectins bind to carbohydrates, so they recognize that the pattern of carbohydrates. Uh, another example is a mannose uh, receptor. It binds mannose, the type of carbohydrate. Dectins are a specific lectin that um, is a pattern recognition receptor for fungal organisms. 
um, DC sign is reluctant to know because it is exploited by HIV. Um, so a series of scavenger receptors, uh, like N formal metamin C receptors, um, these mediate the uptake of oxidized like, proteins. They're potent, uh, potent chemoattractants. Um, so uh, we've kind of talked before about how a cell will um, move towards a, a certain gradient. Um, so certain cells will actually kind of sniff out that new C and follow the gradient. Um, follow the gradient to oh, the site of infection. The defects in this have been linked to aphthous ulcers, recurrent aphthous ulcers, independent of um, a clear rheumatic syndrome. OK. Very quick review of lots of different receptors. So now we're going to talk quickly about the cells of innate immunity. Um, and one of the most important but ones that we kind of forget about being a cell of the innate immune system would be epithelial cells. They actually form the physical barrier uh, from the outside world and prevent the initial infection um, with a microbe. It's only when epithelial cells um, have failed that everything else kind of kicks into gear. So <coughs> outside of just being a physical barrier, they can do things like produce antimicrobial agents, our own um, antibiotics like defensins and catholicines, they produce mucus um, to trap and get microbes out. They also contain lymphocytes, and in general, there are these lymphocytes that kind of bridge the gap between a mate and adaptive immune system. They have somewhat of a limited repertoire. Uh, this is just from a picture from a boss page, uh, figure four or five on page 67. Um, that uh, quickly shows the different functions of epithelial cells, including a physical barrier, um, production of antibiotics and natural antibiotics like catholicines and defensins, and then um, uh, kind of a storage unit for certain um, lymphocytes that will have a limited repertoire uh, to kill. Of course, there are phagocytes. So phagocytes include macrophages and neutrophils. Their job is to internalize and kill microbes. Um, they, of course, produce cytokines that um, direct other cells during an acute infection. And then as their and the infection is waning, they will actually be crucial in repairing the damaged tissue. Uh, dendritic cells, so this part here is actually copied from uh, the board review course that is in Chicago every other year. Um, it talks about, I feel like maybe I already talked about this once this year, I can't remember. Um, but there are different types of dendritic cells. So um, there are myeloid dendritic cells, or DC1 cells, plasmacytoid um, dendritic cells, or DC2 cells. They come from different progenitors. So myeloid comes from myeloid progenitor, um, as do Langerhans dendritic cells and interstitial dendritic cells. Langerhans dendritic cells are the ones um, with the Burbeck granules, the tennis bracket looking um, granules inside uh, that we talk about a lot as the classic dendritic cells found in the epidermis. It's an excellent antigen presenting. <coughs> um, some, though, are. Um, more important in their role for uh, cytokine secretion, in particular plasmacytoid dendritic cells, which actually come from a lymphoid progenitor. Um, and if you kind of think of lymphoid progenitor, it kind of makes more sense that interferon secretion is its um, kind of major role in the innate defense. Interstitial dendritic cells come from myeloid progenitor, but they will actually produce IL-10 and activate B cells. NK cells are another um, important cell in the innate immune system. They actually um, are crucial, crucial for killing other cells. Um, they kill, they don't, without any need for clonal expansion or differentiation. Um, we recognize them through their expression of CD16 and CD56. 
and they will sample many cells and decide whether or not um, to kill that cell based on a balance of activating and inhibiting signals that it receives through different receptors. Uh, one important point that I, this is not something you need to remember now, we'll talk about this many times in this chapter, but NK cell survival depends on IL-15. So um, when you're trying to remember your different phenotypes of skin, um, common gamma chain, I think, um, common gamma chain, skid, awesome. um, common gamma chain signals, um, affects receptors for 2, 5, 7, 9, 15, 21, I think. So 7 is crucial for T cells, 15 is crucial for NK cells. So common gamma chain, skid, you have T negative, B positive, NK negative. Uh, so as you're going through, uh, we'll, I'll kind of comprehensively go over skid towards the end, but um, kind of just recognizing why some things, things happen make the phenotyping much easier. So NK cells, IL-15. Okay. So <clears throat> the inhibitory receptors on NK cells, so these would be um, receptors that are receiving signals that a cell is healthy and doesn't need to be killed. In the cytoplasmic tail, they have something called ITIMs, which have an inhibitory motif, as opposed to an ITAM, which has an activating motif. Um, they block signaling pathways, they recruit phosphatases, and they remove phosphates, so they're inhibiting everything. Giving signals in the uh, any NK cell is going to receive a lot of signals at once, and it's just where the, the balance tips. So it's inhibition, don't kill, or activating. Go ahead, yes, activate, kill the cell. So some of the more common inhibitory receptors, a family of KERS. There's LERS and there's CD94 and KG2A, something that binds to HLAE. You should all be able to recognize as inhibitory receptors. Activating receptors have ITAMs, they have activating motifs at the end that promote killing by recruiting kinases and causing phosphorylation. Examples include NKG2, which binds to MCA and MCB, and CD16. Okay, uh, this is figure 4-6, uh, page 69, and this kind of just gives an example of the activating inhibitory receptors in NK cells. So um, you can see that you'd have a balance of inhibitory receptors and activating receptors. In this case, it's tipping over to inhibitory receptors, it's not activated, so there's no killing. However, if there is a virus infected in a certain cell, that activating signals are going to be upregulated on that side. When NK cell comes, the balance is tipped towards killing. But in reality, what's happening is there's going to be several um, signals provided to an NK cell, so it's a balance which is more. And in this particular case, um, it's a stress cell. There's lots of activating receptors that are being displayed, and it sees and it active it, and it tells the NK cell to go ahead and kill that cell. Um, this is figure 4-7, page 70. I include this because this is actually probably um, another, unfortunately, figure to memorize. Um, at least have a sense of what's inhibitory and what's activating receptors, and especially where the exceptions are. So in general, um, curves are inhibitory, but then there's a cur 2 ds which is activ an activating receptor. Uh, so NK cells um, perform uh, their function through both perforin and granzyme. It's the two main molecules that are used. Perforin allows for entry into another cell, and then granzyme can actually be deposited into the cell and will initiate apoptosis. This is figure 4H on page 71, and it just, um, I guess, kind of demonstrates this. I thought this was a perforin granzyme, but it's really not. Um, 
NK cell sees an, an injured cell virus infected, it actually releases perforin. Perforin will allow um, for a hole in the cell for the granzyme to get through, and then, of course, the cell is effectively killed. Okay, a few more. So, um, like I mentioned before, the epithelium is a region where certain lymphocytes will stay, but they're not the traditional lymphocytes that we think of um, in the adaptive immune system. They kind of bridge the gap between the innate and the adaptive immune system. They have a somewhat limited repertoire. Ones that we've talked about before, B1 B cells, marginal zone B cells, intraepithelial, um, alpha beta T cells or gamma delta T cells. There's also I and K T cells. All are lymphocytes, but they have a very limited wet repertoire um, and are um, really, even though they're lymphocytes, more towards uh, the innate immune system than adaptive or kind of bridges. Of course, mast cells keep us in business. They're in the skin, the mucosa. Um, they are known because they can rapidly secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines. So, um, and they can secrete lipid mediators. Mast cells are fairly unique that the first line of mediators that are secreted are actually already made prepackaged. So when you see a mast cell, you can actually look in the cytoplasm and see um, lots of stuff there. Um, not organelle, but prepackaged mediators ready to go. So as soon as the mast cell receives the signal, it releases these mediators and they happen very quickly. So if the mast cell is getting activated, it often happens very quickly. In 15 minutes, you'll see signs of activation. And the post to most cells that receive a receptor, uh, receptor signal, and it will signal down to the nucleus, and the nucleus then starts working, but it really takes four to six hours for the nucleus to be able to um, release things like cytokines and hemokines uh, for the response to happen. If it's mast cell mediated, it's very quick, 15 minutes. However, there is also a late phase we're familiar with, so the only thing mast cells do is not to just release preformed mediators. That's one of the things that we stereotypically think of a mast cell, but then once that happens, the signal continues to the nucleus and will also cause um, cytokine secretion. Um, So uh, natural antibodies are antibodies that are produced by these lymphocytes with limited repertoire, which I've mentioned just a couple of slides ago, um, in particular these B cells. They have a very limited specificity, and they're made without any prior exposure to antigen. They're specific for certain carbohydrates and lipids that are found in microbes. And they're specific for carbohydrates and lipids that would not typically be found in mammalian cells. Another important part of the innate immune system is the complement pathway, which that we know of gets activated in three ways, the classical pathway, the alternative pathway, and the lectin pathway. It doesn't matter how it starts. Alternative, classical, or lectin, it all ends up in the same um, MAC attack complex, the membrane attack complex that is going to punch up lots of different holes in a cell um, and cause an osmotic gradient to, to eventually kill the cell. Really not anything to know about the complement system at this point. In a different chapter, we'll go through it um, in gory detail. Right now, really just recognize that it's part of the innate immune system a very important part of the innate immune system. Okay, so there is something called pentractions. Pentractions are soluble pattern recognition receptors. So same thing, they're just recognizing camps, but they're soluble. Uh, examples are short pentractions, like CRP, serum amyloid P, acute phase reactants, and then there's long pentractions, like pentraxin 3. Uh, collectins and phycolins are more examples of soluble pattern recognition receptors. Examples of some collectins are mannose binding lectin and pulmonary surfactant proteins, SPA, SPD, and phycolins, all words you've probably heard before, just soluble pattern recognition receptors. And then certain cytokines are crucial to the innate immune system. 
like TNF, IL-1, IL-6, um, particularly good at recruiting leukocytes to a site of infection. Okay. And stepping back just for a minute, we're going to talk about the process of phagocytosis. So we mentioned earlier, um, macrophages and neutrophils are um, very important phagocytes in the innate immune response. Typically, macrophages are at the site of infection or just travel um, a short distance to a site of infection. And they are one of the primary responders in the event um, of an infection. And then they recruit neutrophils. Um, neutrophils are produced um, very, very quickly. And you can see an acute infection. Of course, you can see that in the blood by neutrophil counts going way up. Um, they can travel out to the site of infection where they help the macrophages by this um, process of phagocytosis. So they ex express receptors that will recognize microbes, um, and then they will actually ingest the microbes into vesicles and then internally destroy the microbes. So how does this happen? So of course there's different pattern recognition receptors. In this example, it has a mannose receptor. Uh, binds to mannose on a microbe. Process of phagocytosis actually brings it into the cell, and then the membrane zips up around it, forming a phagosome. The phagosome will then bind with a lysosome, so you have a phagolysosome, and this is where uh, the process of killing occurs. So this happens through something called phagocyte oxidase, NADPH oxidase is another um, term for it. What it does is it changes oxygen into reactive oxygen species, um, such as hydrogen peroxide. And these things will kill the microbe that's been ingested. If something is wrong with your NADPH oxidase, um, you have chronic granulomas disease. There are lots of components to the NADPH oxidase complex, GP91, um, P22, P40, P47, P67. Um, a defect in any of them can lead to chronic granulomas disease. GP91 um, leads to X-linked CGD. This is about 70% of CGD we see. The most common autosomal recessive is um, a defect in P47. all when something goes wrong with this process right here. So you can phagocytose, you can actually have a phagolysosome, but the phagolysosome is not capable of actually killing that microbe. So you end up in kind of a steady state battle and end up with granuloma. OK, so when it's working correctly, what does this whole NADPH oxidase system do? So each individual component makes up the NADPH oxidase. P47, P91. So this complex will take molecular oxygen. It changes it into superoxide ions. And then by superoxide dismutase, change to um, will create hydrogen peroxide, which then can change NPO uh, to hydrochloric acid or maybe hydrochlorous acid. I'm not sure which. Which? Hypochlorous acid. Hypochlorous <coughs> Um, all of which are capable of um, killing the ingested microbe. And, and what you're doing is you're going down the line there, with the superoxide ion being the most deadly and the uh, hydroxyl radicals being the least deadly, but they're all really serious. Okay. Um. This is figure 413 um, on page 80. It just goes over the effector functions of the macrophage. So of course, they um, through the pattern recognition receptors, they can recognize the patterns of microbes. Um, they will, of course, ingest uh, microbes and undergo phagocytosis. They secrete cytokines that enhance the immune response um, and actually direct the adaptive immune response to what to do. And then, of course, at the end of um, the infection, like I mentioned before, it's in important for tissue remodeling, for actually repairing what has been damaged. 
All right, I think this is um, close to the end. <coughs> um, one last section on the acute inflammatory response. I mentioned briefly some uh, things that happen in the acute inflammatory response, like the secretion of endogenous pyrogens, which increase prostaglandins by the hypothalamus. Endogenous, endogenous pyrogens include TNF, IL-1, and IL-6. It's also induced into hepatocytes to express acute phase reactions and can lead to septic shock if it's not turned off and regulated appropriately. Um, on page 414, uh, figure 414 on page 82, it just shows the local systemic actions of the cytokines and acute inflammatory response. I'm not going to go over this um, in much detail, nor do I think you need to know it at this point in much detail. Most of the stuff is reviewed um, elsewhere. Kind of know the key cytokines that are used in the innate immune response and some of the uh, systemic effects that occur, like fever, leukocyte production, um, insulin resistance, permeability, and endothelium. Uh, the antiviral response specifically um, is often mediated by type 1 interferons. Interferons are named interferons because they interfere with replic viral replication. Uh, right. yeah, I'm not sure I have much else to say about um, this pathway. Uh, it's reviewed in Figure 416 um, on page 84, the action of the interferons on uh, viral replication. Um, yes, yeah, without any specific pointers or guidance. <laughs> That's about it. Um, so don't get too overwhelmed with this chapter. It's very difficult. Um, get familiar with pattern records and risk and receptors. Know a lot of detail about um, TLRs, NK signaling. Really just recognize some of the other components of the innate immune system. We'll go over the complement later, and that will be a huge um, uh, source of testable information, I think. But that's it, unless there's any questions. Thank you. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. See you next time.